and came across uh, Link Local recently. And, and, and saw that this thing Good evening, everyone. Everyone grab a seat. Um, I appreciate everyone coming. We are beaming live stream from this camera here, and we'll be taping Cal's wonderful presentation. We're beaming it up on the YouTube channel. I'm Fred McMurray, and uh, I'm part of the Link Local Network. I'd like to recognize three of our group managers, Lori Husband, Ann Potts, and Hal Cohn. Without them, this wouldn't happen. Um, and with that, I'll say please welcome Hal. He's the Yard Continuous Improvement Expert. Hi. I, I don't know about this expert thing, but absolutely. Um, my name is Hal Kahn, and I'm the president of a company called HKC Operations. We focus on performance, productivity, and profitability improvement for companies of all types. So, i.e., I am the continuous improvement guy. So tonight, I'd like to discuss continuous improvement with everybody. Continuous improvement is more than simply a catchphrase. It's a buzzword in a lot of companies, but it's more than just a catchphrase, or even a culture within an organization. Continuous improvement, to be effective, is truly a way of life within an organization. Okay, so, that being said, what is continuous? Continuous improvement is a model that creates value within organizations. So we need to take a second and talk about what that really means because pretty much you make that statement, it's like, huh? So basically, when we talk about value, value is not just price. Okay? Value to me is quality plus service at the right price. So for example, Walmart. Take them, they're, they're an excellent example of this. Walmart used to say, always the low price, always. Except they found out that that's a fairly destructive model. One of my favorite uh, quotes of all time is, how did you go broke slowly at first, and then all of a sudden, okay? So Walmart has actually even moved to the low price leader, okay? They lead in low pricing, but they don't guarantee that they are always the lowest price because that's just a self-destructive model of competition. And there's a lot more to value than simply cost. That's where most people's minds go, what did I pay for this, et cetera, et cetera. But really, what is it worth? What's the service I get? So, for example, as a very young man, okay, I used to go to mid-range type department stores to buy gifts for my wife as opposed to somewhere where I could probably get it for less money. However, I couldn't go to that lower end discounter store and walk up to a young lady that was about the same size because there was nobody that like that working in the department and say, you know what, my wife's about your size. Let's go pick some clothes. Okay. To me, that was a value. So even though I was spending real dollars, for me, the value was in getting somebody else to pick the right stuff so I could come off looking like a hero when I got home, okay? So that's value. And of course, service is part of that. Then, operations. Because when you talk about operations, the first thing, and especially in a group like this where we're you know, talking primarily about manufacturing, the manufacturing tools. However, when people talk about manufacturing or operations, everybody's mind goes straight to the production floor. That's what people think when you say operations. But if we really back up a half a second and we think about it, operations include a lot of things. They include the front office, you know, the executive, strategy, the finance, customer relations, sales, Basically, anybody who is interfacing directly with the customer. But if you think about it, you say, well, you know, our financial operations, our sales operations, all of these are operations. Okay. We also have the back office, accounting, administration, IT, customer service, you know, basically everything else that happens to support the 
production on the floor. Because at the end of the day, I believe that all functions within an organization exist to support the people that are out there doing the heavy lifting every day. Because the folks that are out there doing the heavy lifting actually generating the dollars or generating the product that generates the revenue, those are the folks that are actually bringing in the money. And guess what? Without revenue, there's no profit, period, end of sentence. Because you can have 100% EBITDA, but 100% is zero is zero. Okay? So the entire organization should be built as such to really support the folks that are generating the real dollars within the organization. Okay? Um, and then, of course, we have the production, the actual manufacturing, the inventory, order fulfillment. Those folks that, you know, even, even in a uh, service or service oriented organization where you're producing a service, well, that's still production. There are people that are performing those services. Ergo, production. Um, and, you know, just, just before we get into this, take one half a step back. Slides anymore. Um, basically, we're talking about continuous improvement, which is a process. Okay. Well, if we think about it, all work in and of itself is a process. We have a process. We have a plan, more or less, whether we think about it or not, on what we do. So, just to get here this evening, you went through a process. We'll leave out the part about you getting dressed. Okay. But basically, you went out to your car, you got in, you fired it up, you followed whatever route you needed to take to get here, you shut off your car, you came inside. All of that is a process. There were steps involved in performing what you did. So that being said, continuous improvement process can be applied to all of those functions we just talked about. So, why do it? Why worry about continuous improvement? Well, basically, because developing the right continuous improve, improvement program will drive performance, productivity, and profitability throughout an entire organization. Okay? So, consequently, how does it do that? It leverages the human element. It humanizes the workplace which I know sounds a little strange, but at the same time, what it really does, okay, is oftentimes we talk about, we use words like human resources, human capital, okay? Well, <laughs> um, what are resources, what is capital? By definition, they're assets, okay? So the most valuable asset we generally have within our organization is our human assets, okay? They're the ones that drive the business because you can have all the technology, you can have all the process, you can have everything else, but if you don't have people executing, it doesn't matter, okay? So, human element's a good one. Um, I wasn't sure. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> I had to throw you a bump, you know? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Easy, Fred. Okay. It also encourages improved quality of work life. Okay? Basically, if it makes your job easier, isn't life better? You know, who wants to work harder than they really, really have to? Okay? You know, it just doesn't make a lot of sense that people will go in and, that, and they'll just be frustrated and they, and they run into these walls time after time after time. It's a bad work life. Who wants to live like that? So having the right kind of continuous improvement will help you work smarter, not harder. Okay? Also, it both teaches our employees, or the entire workforce actually, and the other folks within, you know, the other tangential people involved, to apply the scientific method. Meaning, you know, there's a lot more, there's a lot of 
a lot of different ways to go about continuous improvement and how to quantify what your goals actually are and how to get there, et cetera, et cetera. Way too often we rely very heavily on technology and things become so data driven. Well, the key component of the human side of things, what do people do? There's a lot of anecdotal evidence out there. You know, you, you'll often hear people talk about, well, I just know this in my gut. My gut says, okay, my gut says, and I eat a lot, okay, but that's about all it says. Because what that really means when people are saying, my gut says, or I just know it, is they really kind of thought things through. The information's there, they just don't know how to access the information. They just believe it because they actually worked it through in their head. They just don't know why, okay, or how they got there. So consequently, this teaches them how to quantify what it is that they're trying to accomplish and how to get it out there and make it so that they can apply real world methodology to getting things done. And then of course, the biggie that most guys that do what I do talk about a lot is it identifies and eliminates waste. So, and I happen to be kind of a traditionalist when it comes to waste, okay? Because elimination of waste in my area really boils down to waste is defined as something that a customer will not pay for, okay? Waste is anything that the customer is not willing to pay for, okay? However, if we really think about that one for just a second, what's a customer? Because we have customers within our organization and outside. So we have the consumer of our goods, but we also have customers inside an organization. So if we want to talk about something that oftentimes would be defined as a wasted uh, expenditure within an organization, loss prevention is one of those things that often is considered a sunk cost, okay? Because why would the customer out there pay for loss prevention? Well, the customer out there, there's a couple of reasons I can think of right off the top of my head. One is because it keeps their prices down too, but that's the easy one that everyone talks about. Forget about the consumer for a second of the goods that you're actually manufacturing, and think about the internal customers for a second. Because what you've really got in the internal customers are those stakeholders that are affected by it. So people who are relying on returns on their investment, the management that could be have their income to, you know, tied to EBITDA, et cetera, et cetera. So if you reduce shrink, you're more profitable, that's a good thing. And as when I was a COO, I was more than willing to pay for reduce shrink so that it would bring up the profits and improve our EBITDA. Okay. So by definition then, it really is something that a customer will pay for because everybody in that chain is really a customer. Okay? So, who's involved? Well, stakeholders. What's a stakeholder? Well, a stakeholder is anybody that is related to the good service company. You know, it's easy to define. You've got your executives, okay? You've got the executive. Got a question for I was just going to say, stakeholder means a bit different when you're in a slaughterhouse. <laughs> well, it also means something different when you're up at Weber up there, too, but that's okay. Um, we can talk about that afterward, Fred. We'll take it offline. Anyway, so we've got our executives. Executives. There we go. <laughs> Annie was really engaged. I'm so, we got the executives at the top level, all right? We've got our managers. We've got administrators, supervisors, the workers, I'll stay away from the word labor, okay? And customers, okay? So, really, who's involved? 
everybody in the organization. Everybody from the chairman or CEO all the way down to the guy that's sweeping the floors at night. That's who needs to be involved in a successful continuous improvement program. Everybody has to be engaged. And there's some real good reasons for that. Because one of the key pieces to this is this right here, workers, okay? Everybody's got input and feedback into this, but again, you know, like we were talking about just a second ago, the worker, the guy that's really executing, doing the heavy lifting, the end user of the process is one of the biggest beneficiaries of the process. And two, by engaging that individual, making them know that you understand where they're at, then that helps just with quality of work life, productivity, attitude. Attitude goes a long way. I'm an old, I'm an old Marine, so simply you believe you can do it, you know. The difficult we do immediately, the impossible takes just a little longer, okay? So consequently, what you want to do is get everybody engaged when practicing. So the customers get feedback from the customers because how is it affecting them? What can you do better that will affect them, which then drives your business forward? And there are also uh, people peripherally involved that aren't the customers. Because the customer may not well be the end user of that good or service either. You know? And then we won't even get into how other people can be affected by certain products, et cetera. But these are all things that we take into account. And if you really look at it, there's a lot of companies pursuing that path today when they talk about moving toward being a green company. How does it affect all these other things? So this is all part and parcel of things that we want to look at in our continuous improvement programs. So, how do we implement the continuous improvement program? First, before I, you know, really kind of get into the steps of that, as I mentioned before, there's, there's several different disciplines that go into continuous improvement. There's a lot of different ways to approach this subject. Some of them are extremely focused on data or extremely focused the opposite way, or some of them involve, you know, just very small incremental but across the board improvement. And some of them foster or encourage breakthrough or leap improvement because what you're really doing is you're taking breaking out a small segment and learning the pilot in something that's a real world process and if it works there you can expand etc. So basically today we're really going to focus on the basics. We're not going to get down in the weeds. Annie and I get into our little process walk conversations offline and that's good. Okay but due to time constraints and basically interest level audience interest we're not going to go there. We're just going to keep it up here at the high level. Oh, yes, and Fred's cheering. You can, you can cheer out loud. Uh, so we'll keep it up at the high level and just focus on the very basics. So what's the first thing we have to do? Well, we need to define the process. So we've got to establish the objectives, methods. How are we going to do this? The goals and the metrics. So really, like I like to say, Almost everything that we do in business improvement or process improvement and all of these things boil down to a couple of things. What and how, okay? Because at the end of the day, that's, that's what matters. What are you gonna execute and how are you gonna execute it? Okay, so really, we're gonna define the process, we're gonna establish those rules, and we're gonna talk about what do we wanna do, how are we gonna do it, how are we gonna measure it, and how are we gonna know that we succeeded at what we set out to do. Then, we're going to, are you reading that thing? <laughs> My lovely assistant, Dan. Thank you. Yes, everyone's going to say Dan. Vanna? Uh, <laughs> we could have Vanna coming over and point the board for us. Anyway, so after we define it, what do we want to do? Well, we need to measure actually start to implement and then measure 
what it is that we set out to do, how much time went into it, what and who was necessary, what were the resources, so you know, what materials did we need, what people needed to be involved, what outside things did we need, and then how much effort was involved in this, what were our associated costs, what were our results, all of those types of things we need to measure what we had, okay? what we actually accomplished. Then we evaluate, which very simply put is we assess against what we just found out that we actually did versus what we set out to do. Simplest way to put it. Did we get to where we were trying to get to? Okay, or how close to where we wanted to be did we get? Okay, and then of course the next step in the process, there we go, refine, all right? So we bring innovation to the process. You know, uh, very simply, you know, what could we do better? How can we get closer? What can we add? What other gains can we get out of this process? And then, if we actually hit our mark, or came close to hitting our mark, okay, what can this be expanded into? Are there other, especially if you broke it into a small segment of one endeavor within the organization? You know? So if it's within accounting, and we were only applying these techniques to AR, well, what if this is applicable to the accounts payable department? And how does it affect them? And what ripples were caused by the things that we did over here, and how can we improve this to better improve those? Not only that, but it will also arise other issues. You'll notice all of a sudden, wow, I thought this was working really well over here in this department. They got problems too. So it's kind of that ripple effect. Ripple effect. And then, basically, we just we standardize our new methods that we came up with, okay? We standardize those new approved processes. And then we continue indefinitely, okay? We build on the momentum gain. So basically what we're doing is it, it becomes, and this next slide kind of makes it a little easier to see. This, as I said to my friend Ann a little bit earlier, okay? Continuous improvement for dummies. I'm a Marine, I like it simple, okay? So this is actually, you know, the Demi model. Um, but it really simplifies it. We plan, define goals, design the process. We try it, okay, on the smallest measurable scale. Because really, you know, it doesn't do any good if you go too small because you really don't know what your results are. But if you do it small and you grow it out, then that's how you get those leaps forward in process. We check, so we measure and compare our results against our expectations. And then we act, which is really to evaluate on these other steps, the P, the D, the C, the plan, you check, we evaluate or expand scale, you know, expand the scale or the scope. Um, and then we basically, if you look, it's a circle, we rinse and repeat, okay? So, at the end of the day, if you really look at that, it's, it's like this concentric ring. And if you do this in a continuous improvement program, the reason it builds on itself is simply because in motion, if you've ever watched something like, you know, again, nice, simple little entertainment. Go watch the water gurgle down the drain some of the time, okay? And if you look at it, out here it starts slowly. And then, I'm easily abused. Um, <laughs> <huh>? Obviously. <laughs> but seriously, there's a lesson to be taken away from that. Because if you really watch that, I mean, this is something I learned when I was about three, watching the water in the drain. Okay? And it starts out, and it's moving kind of slow, but as it gets closer to the drain, it gets faster and faster and faster. Why? Because it's spinning in much smaller concentric circles. Same is true of continuous improvement. That's the whole point behind continuous improvement. If you follow this particular model, it's not a line, even though it is a continuum, 
you just continue to refine and build momentum as you're zeroing in on the perfect. Because you know, there's a lot of different ways to measure things. Um, and as everybody knows, really, are you ever going to get to zero defects? Probably not. But there are certain components of your business that you can get to zero tolerance for, which are these higher level things. And if you get to enough few defects, if you, you lower that scale so far, it may as well be zero because it really doesn't matter. Nobody's going to get the bad thing. Okay. So basically, to kind of throw in a few, uh, a few of the final thoughts here, kind of recapsulate here. One, there's several different disciplines like we were talking about. Okay. They involve, depending on the discipline, some disciplines involve dedicated resources. So full-time employees, that their whole mission in their work life is to improve the business on a continual basis. You have outside resources, like a few of us in this room, whose primary fun in life, that's a scary thing, it's like watching water go down the drain, but hopefully it never goes down the drain if they bring us in. But there's outside resources that get brought in to foster and facilitate on a regular or periodic basis the continuous improvement program and really help those internal resources because they can't afford to have dedicated resources to want to or choose not to. And then there's my personal favorite, okay, and that's where we started, the way of life, which is in essence a holistic approach that can include, you know, tools like quality circles. What the hell's a quality circle, you might say? Okay, very likely a lot of people would. You know, basically, a quality circle is additional duties. It, it, it includes representatives from every level within an organization that's affected by the process that you're talking about. And it includes a representative of this, and it's, it's in addition to their regular duties. Basically, they get together on a regular basis, maybe once, once a week, once every other week, whatever the period might dictate, and they discuss how they can make things better on an everyday basis within that particular operation. Okay, so it fosters that engagement of everybody, and you garner the knowledge of those folks that are really dealing with it, and the folks that have to explain it. And everybody in between. Okay? So that's why it's kind of my personal favorite. Then we've got the goals of these several disciplines. What, what's in common? Because we've talked about the diversity, but really, what do they have in common? Because at the end of the day, what, what we all want to do is improve the business. So they've got the goals and the principles are basically the same. You know, they're they have a common purpose. They're creating value within the organization. They're driving forward that value proposition. They eliminate the gap between theory and practice. And again, offline, anybody wants to hear it, I got a great joke. I just won't tell it online um, about theory and practice or theory and reality. And then, of course, they engage in all levels throughout an, throughout an organization because without the engagement and support of everybody, it's not going to work. And it also makes everybody's life better because, hey, I know one reason that I have so little of it and continue to wear it so short is in a frustration situation. I used to always clutch my hair. <laughs> okay. You know, got a good program. You don't need to do as much hair clutching. So, that wraps up what I have to say. Anybody here have anything to say? Questions, comments, discussion? Please. Well, a business owner who's looking to improve his business uh -huh. is confronted with a whole lot of possibilities. Absolutely. Uh, you, know, you just spoke to continuous improvement. 
if I'm, I'm being battered with lean or six sigma and all these other things that promise to make my business better, where does this fit? In other words, who's the ideal candidate for this versus these other things? Frankly, when I brought up the diverse methods that are the diverse methods that are applied. Would you repeat the oh, I'm sorry. Repeat the question. The question is, how does how how does continuous improvement fit in with the business owner that's being battered by all of these different types of methods like lean, what's most important, lean, six, six sigma, or the one word I didn't mention but actually happens to be the discipline that I follow, Kaizen. Okay. How does the how does the business owner know what's right? Actually, when you start breaking it down, those are really the tools. Okay. So really it's not about what is the right is it lean or is it Six Sigma? Well, Six Sigma actually applies lean, okay? Kaizen is really, you know, I talked about the Deming principles because I was trying to keep it, you know, up out of the weeds. Kaizen was developed by a guy named Toyota who learned about the PCDA from Deming, okay? He's also the inventor of TQM and lean. Lean is a spinoff from Toyota. So, Kaizen applies lean manufacturing. And if you really think about it, if you've got continuous improvement, here's a great example. You know, because I said, hey, it's got to involve everybody from the chairman to the guy that sweeps the floor, right? Well, that guy sweeping the floor sees a whole lot of little component parts that go into your production every day on the floor as he's sweeping them up. Well, if he never says anything, that's a lot of waste that's going right out the door every night because parts are being dropped. Plus, time is being wasted because people are moving around. Part of lean, you know, we talked about eliminating waste. That's the entire principle of lean is waste elimination. And every one of those disciplines that you brought up, or two, or, you know, but virtually every discipline for continuous improvement applies lean. So the real difference is we're not talking about a tool. Somebody that's the right fit, the right, say, resource to help that business owner make those decisions is not going to be tied to only one discipline. <coughs> what he's going to do is he's going to use the right tool for that business owner. Because really, the tools, more often than not, if you're going to do it properly, are designed, they're, they're really, let's say they're driven by the fit to the organization. So some organizations, because of outside variables or inside variables, or, you know, I was a Marine. The Army, they use Six Sigma, okay? They're tied to Six Sigma. That's the way it works. Other organizations within the Fed will use Kaizen, okay? But at the end of the day, does it really matter? I mean, that's like talking about, well, do you use a balanced scorecard methodology? or some other process for measuring how things go. They're tools. So at the end of the day, you want to use the right tool for the right organization. On the same line as, as what he was asking, if I'm understanding it correctly, is in our business and the different companies we see, the companies that are moving forward use continuous improvement process. Now, which one they choose, that's out of my realm as far as what you're saying, as far as whether it's Kaizen or Six Sigma. But all the companies that we've seen that grow and are moving forward are doing some form of continuous improvement process on an individual basis as well as a company. I guess the word here is really process. If they're following something where they're measuring it, where they're able to see the difference of where it's working, where it's not working, everyone that's successful from what I've seen uses a continuous improvement process. Which one they choose, that's out of my Okay, so that's a great point. That's a really great point. Because in order to be successful, you really do need to. I mean, we're all constantly, if you just think about it, you know, from the time we're little tiny babies, we're trying to get better at virtually everything we do. Right. And why should that not apply to businesses? If you're going to be successful, you're always striving to be better. You did a great job of staying away from all the tool 
terminology. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I worked yeah. hard at that. <laughs> I saw yeah. it. Because I, I am the process one. Okay? <laughs> yeah, I saw <laughs> it. Um, and in answer to Tim's question, my perspective on this thing, and I've got quite a bit of background in it, is it's about creating a culture for that business owner or the companies that you're talking about. Right yeah. The idea behind it is creating a culture where whether it's Lean, whether it's Kaizen, whether it's Six Sigma, that those things can be tools used by the people, but getting the people to use the tool is really the job of like the business owner and his staff mm -hmm. to create an environment where those the people, the guy on the floor doing the sweeping or doing the production process, really want to contribute and make as much their company as the business owner's company. And it's about creating that culture the of, of content, a way, the way of life that I was talking about. Right. To get that throughout the company, right. from a leadership business owner perspective, that's the trick. That's where the real challenge is. Because there are companies out there that have started on some of these approaches. And today, they get the, in the literature on continuous improvement, they get looked at as a new set of leadership came in with a different focus and a new program came in. Whereas continuous improvement sort of becomes the umbrella term of how are we continually doing that day by day, week by week, month by month, moving forward to create a culture that embodies this whole process. So that would be my answer to your question. Yeah, and, and to how you approach the business owner. And to feed off of that, quite frankly, if you really think about it, at heart, everybody wants to believe that what they do is important. People want to feel that they make a difference. You know, hey, I'm here, notice me. So continuous improvement in fostering that, you know, I, I talked more about the scientific method than the actual benefit of it. But basically, that's the engagement from the employee. You're telling them, hey, I care about what you have to say. What you know more about this than I do. I touched on eliminating the gap between theory and practice. Well, to put that into a slightly different perspective, okay, as we all know, the guy up here, the CEO, the COO, all of these folks up in as the guys on the floor will often refer to it, the ivory tower, haven't got a clue what the heck goes on in the business every day, okay? And frankly, way too often, and it's really unfortunate when they do, a lot of these folks at the ivory tower believe that the people out here, if they really knew what they were doing, would be over here in management. When a lot of these guys love what they do, they want to stay on the sharp end of the spear every day, okay? So basically, by bringing these things together in a continuous improvement environment, that engagement that I was talking about is really making people understand that you recognize that they're important, okay? You know, some of it just comes down to <coughs> education techniques for that matter, because I mean, if you really think about it, there's been a wealth of information on how basically even you know, just if you put it in the simplest terms, women and men perceive things. Okay? So for example, if my good friend Ann was having a hard day and came to me and we were having a cup of coffee and she said, Man, I got this client, major pain, da 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 da. -da. Now, because Anne's a process wonk, she might actually want advice, but more likely, she wants to know somebody's listening and actually cares that she had a bad day, okay? Where on, whereas on the other hand, my good friend Marty, who couldn't make it tonight because he's traveling, okay? Another process wonk. If Marty came to me, same scenario, same conversation, Marty doesn't want to know that I care what he has to say. He wants to know what I got to say about it so he doesn't have to deal with it anymore, okay? And that's just a difference in our perspectives. So consequently, everybody wants to know that somebody understands. And 
that they care about what they think. And that's what continuous improvement does. It really, I say gap between theory and practice, what it really does is it fosters true communication between all levels of the organization. And that's how you move it forward. Anything else? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm gonna I'd like to thank everyone for coming. We're gonna shut off our internet broadcast now. Thanks for everyone in internet land and how you have one of the the largest um, viewing audiences we've ever had on, on it actually rivals the uh, business of social media um, one event earlier this year. So you're an internet TV star and I've gotten at least one request for your PowerPoint in our viewing audience. Well, you know, I would know that was because of the subject matter, and it had nothing to do with my pretty face. Well, we'll put that out as a poll. So, <laughs> if you're watching on the internet and you think Hal's got a pretty face, tweet at me, Facebook me, some other social media one. Oh, we'll get to me. <laughs> well, I thank everyone for coming. Anyways, I'm going to shut this down, and people can network that. So, thanks.